Uh, the next speaker is going to be Doris Holmes. He is a business trial lawyer with Deutsch, Kerrigan and Stiles in New Orleans, Louisiana. He has more than 25 years of experience representing clients in the areas of antitrust and trade regulation, bankruptcy, business organization, contracts, D&O liability, franchising, health care, insurance, IP, M&A, shareholders' rights, and trusts and estates. Doris is on the executive board of the Southeast Louisiana Area Council of the Boy Scouts of America as well, and he is going to be uh, giving an ethics presentation on social media in litigation. Please join me in welcoming him. I have to follow up on one thing that, that Lou Weiner said earlier. This, which if I can get it to work right, is never, ever an appropriate ringtone for your mother. <laughs> this girl was apparently not from the South. However, we do make an exception for ex-spouses ringtones, which <clears throat> that may or may not be. Um, about three weeks ago, I was talking to one of our associates, and I commented about the word word processor. And he looked at me blankly and said, what's a word processor? I proceeded to tell him about walking to work barefoot in the snow, yes, in New Orleans, with my four megabytes of RAM and my laptop and my 120 megabyte hard drive. And of course, he also had no clue what I was talking about there either. And the reason is simple. We now have in our pockets, your smartphone does a thousand or a million times what we could do 25 years ago. And now we had no concept then of what social media was. And of course now, if you look at the numbers on what is happening with social media, the numbers have gone up just since the, the written materials in the book. Uh, our marketing director, when I submitted the, the PowerPoint slides, said, oh, by the way, I updated your numbers for you. Because Facebook had just reported on their quarter, they've, they've gone up uh, even more uh, with over 800, uh, with over, actually, I think it's up to about 1.3 billion. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't read that. The numbers are, are there. And also, the, uh, the, the bigger figure to me, though, is looking at it is the number of comments that are posted on Facebook profiles. You have every second, five new Facebook profiles are created. Every 60 seconds, there are 510 comments posted, 293,000 statuses updated, and 136,000 photos are uploaded. And if you look at Twitter, you've got 500 million tweets per, uh, per day. YouTube, the numbers are, are up there you know, as well. You've got more than a billion unique users visiting YouTube each month. Uh, Instagram came out in October of 2010. And within the first 24 hours, uh, 5 million videos were uploaded. What is the significance of all of these numbers to, to you as an attorney? Well, the fact is social media, and I say this with peace and love as someone who visits social media quite often, social media is an awesome playground for the criminally stupid. <laughs> they will post anything and everything that you can imagine. Uh, most recently, I mean, last week, a friend's talking about her son and his ex-wife with a potential custody dispute. The ex-wife is telling him, oh, you know, can you come take care of, of, of our daughter because I have to go run errands? Oh, sure, no problem. Well, this kid's wife has a sense to have actually friended the ex-wife as one of five different guys because apparently she'll friend any guy out there. Promptly looks on her Facebook page and sees that she's partying all afternoon and posted pictures of it on Facebook. So this is the type of thing you can expect in looking at, at potential uh, plaintiffs, witnesses, jurors, all the above, even some judges, as we'll get to in a minute. The uh, first question is an obvious one. Are social, uh, I forgot my cartoon, sorry. Uh, yeah, then this fits in perfectly with the criminally stupid. Zero friends, 75 acquaintances, one nemesis, nine online stalking victims. That's probably slightly below average for me, but there you go. Uh, are social networking sites potential sources of evidence? Of course, for the reasons that I've said, but it, uh, don't take my word for it. The New York Bar Association had issued a, an opinion in 2010 talking about the potential uses for social media, and they pointed out how potentially helpful that 
uh, such evidence is in cases. I sat on a panel with a state court judge and a federal magistrate judge about five years ago, and the state judge said then, said the, the domestic lawyers have this down already. They're, they're all over this. They're, they're using it all the time before most of us had even thought of it. The first time I saw a presentation with subpoenas for Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, it was a matrimonial lawyer. Uh, they have it down pat. The federal judge said, I'm going to give you discovery on this. She said, and I know what I'm going to give you, and you better be asking for it, because if you're not, you're failing your client. So it's out there, and we need to be looking for it. Uh, now, does a lawyer have an actual obligation to investigate online? We have the traditional rules that, that we follow that, that are really no different in this context. Uh, Model Rule 1.3 says a lawyer shall act with reasonable diligence and promptness in representing a client. The Comment 5 to 1.1 says competent handling includes inquiry into analysis of the factual and legal elements. And in fact, in 2012, Comment 8 was amended to specifically say that lawyers should keep abreast of changes in the law and its practice, including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. They, they were specifically dealing in that case, as I recall, with the issue of cloud computing, but it certainly applies in this situation as, as well. Uh, question three, have the courts uh, recognized the failure to use technology as grounds for relief? Uh, there seems to be limited jurisprudence on this. There is a, a Utah case in which the court, the, the in, it was an ineffective assistance of counsel case. And the question arose whether or not that the defense lawyer should have called an expert of their own. And in fact, you know, the court pointed out that just a simple Google search should have shown that you know, something that the defense could have discovered in, in 30 seconds uh, about the doctor that they came in to, to bring an opinion on, on the ineffective assistance of counsel. And one thing we're going to see throughout this is there are a few cases on these various uh, topics. And I would suggest the reason is Real simple, is that federal magistrate judge pointed out, you better be asking for social media and discovery. And by the same token, don't leave anything to chance in this. You're not going to go in with what you're investigating online, looking at online on your own, and be able to get that into court. Use your formal discovery to request these things anyway. Uh, and for our purposes today, don't underestimate that, but we're really talking about what can you do on an informal basis as well. When looking at specific uh, social media involving a, a opponents, you know, the question is, can you Facebook friend a, a plaintiff or, for that matter, a defendant? And that's pretty simple because Rule 4.2 prohibits you from contacting a client that's, that's already represented. So in, that, in this situation, it, it's, no, it's no different. The uh, next question is, you know, can you accept a Facebook friend request or another social media request. The, the answer is clearly no to that as well. Comment 3 specifies that if you can't do it yourself, then uh, you're, you, you can't accept it. You can't communicate with anyone at all. Now, one question that arises is in a situation such as with Twitter, I've had at least three opposing attorneys tell me in the middle of a case, oh, I follow you on Twitter. I said, who are you again? And it's not who are you in real life, it's who are you on Twitter? Oh, boat lawyer, it's nice to meet you. you know, they, they don't give out their real name. So what happens if you have uh, a plaintiff or a defendant try to contact you and friend you and you don't know it? That's actually pretty simple as well because the, the rules do say that if you become aware of the situation, then you should terminate any, any communication. So if you have no way of knowing that this person, uh, who this person is because they're anonymous, then, uh, then you're okay. Uh, can you send a Facebook friend request if you're, we're talking about third parties, in, partic in particular with witnesses? Uh, and where we've come down on this is basically they, they have said that you can, depending on the, on the jurisdiction, the, under the, the rules, deal with terms in terms of making false statements, whether or not the potential person, uh, the, the person that you're dealing with understands your role as, as a lawyer in the case. And in the Philadelphia Bar Association has actually issued an opinion saying that you cannot friend any uh, third party witnesses unless you disclose your identity and also why you're friending them. So that's going to go over great when you tell the witness, oh, you know, they ask you, why are you doing this? Oh, well, I'm, I'm about to subpoena you in this case, or I want you to rat out your best friend, or, or whatever. So that's generally not going to work. 
Uh, has any bar association held that you can still make a friend request without uh, actually disclosing the true purpose? Yes, the, the New York Bar Association has said that as long as you identify who you are, then you're okay. You do not have to tell the purpose. Um, again, you're going to have a situation there probably where somebody wants you, you they, if they come back and ask, well, who are you? Uh, why are you confronting me? Then you're going to have an obligation to tell them the truth. But otherwise, you, you would be okay under the New York New York opinion. Uh, the, the next few questions deal with whether or not you know when there's evidence on these uh, social media sites. And uh, Rule 3.4 says that you cannot unlawfully obstruct a, pars a party's access to evidence, unlawfully alter, destroy, or conceal a document. Um, and then the Rule 8.4 also says that, you, that as a lawyer, you cannot assist a client in doing that. After I submitted these materials, I went back looking and I said, there's got to be some more concrete examples of this. And in fact, I wish I had the picture. There was a picture of a guy holding a beer, and this is a, he's a plaintiff in a wrongful death case, the death of his wife. And within a year, he's on Facebook holding a beer with a T-shirt that says, I heart hot mamas. And his lawyer tells him, you know, it would be best if your Facebook page goes away. A paralegal goes further and says, sees that picture and basically says, this and some other things need to go away. Uh, the, the end result in that case was and that the plaintiff's lawyer had apparently committed a few other violations, but he was, uh, he was sanctioned $542,000 and, and retired from the practice of law when all was said and done. That was a case called Lester v. Ally Concrete in Virginia in 2013. Uh, may, I can't, may I tell the client, to, and, and one point backing up for a second on that, that doesn't mean you can't tell a client, okay, here on out, don't put anything out there. In fact, I would recommend that you rec tell your clients to be circumspect in what they put out there, never anything about the case, the other party, that type of thing. Uh, can you tell a client to change a profile page to, to private? Uh, this is an interesting question because it says you can't alter, destroy, or conceal a document or other material having potential evidentiary uh, value. Uh, if you tell the, the client to go private, is that concealing anything? I'd submit to you there's, there's no authority one way or the other that I've been able to find on this, but I would say no, again, because you do have that formal discovery process where it's still out there, it's just not publicly available, and you can get it through a subpoena. What about uh, letting a client post misleading or inaccurate information? That's an easy no under the model rules. That's, that's no different than things were before. It's just easier now with social media for a client to get the word out there. But no, under model rule 3.4b and 8.4, you cannot. What about posting inaccurate information of your own online about an investigation or litigation in which you're participating? Again, no, uh, you can't. Under Rule 4.1, you are prohibited from making any kind of false statements to a, to a third person. What about uh, if you're not in a, a situation posting online about something that is not false but may materially affect the litigation? Again, answers no under Rule 3.6a. You can't post anything material of prejudicing. prejudicing uh, same is true for it, if it's a case that another attorney is handling, you can't, same thing, just if you can't do it for yourself, you can't do it for anyone else either. Uh, next is the question of jurors. Uh, the ABA came out with an opinion in April uh, basically saying that you cannot friend potential jurors once you find out you know, who's in the jury pool. You can't friend them. The New York County Lawyers Association Committee had actually, back in 2011, dealt with this a, a little further. Basically, you can research jurors. You can't attempt to friend them because that's ex parte conduct. Uh, the same thing goes for during the trial. You can't send any kind of friend request to the uh, jurors because that could potentially influence the juror. One uh, interesting point in the, the, that New York County Lawyers Association Committee, they said that this prohibition may even extend to uh, websites. And what it was is they said you can't do anything that would alert the jury to, or the juror to, to who you are and wh why you're making the inquiry. 
if you never noticed before, if you have a LinkedIn page, you can go and say, see who's been viewing my page. So if you were to go to a juror's page and that were to show up, you would have violated the rule potentially right there. What about in the situation of, of uh, online jurors? Uh, do I have an obligation to report, you know, to be aware of the danger of online jurors? Uh, if you don't, you're making a huge mistake. There's a list right here of, you know, of cases and this in ray methyl ter tertiary butyl ether case mentions a whole string of situations in which jurors are going online. There's actually a publication, uh, an article in the, the Duke Technology Law Journal as well, where they surveyed jurors in 2011 and 2012 about how they were using, uh, how they were using social media during, uh, uh, during the case. And you know, basically, they all were. And the conclusion there is, you know, is to deal with it, first of all, with, with jury instructions. And at least 12 jurisdictions and four federal courts have adopted a model instruction regarding a juror's online usage. Uh, model instructions are available from the, uh, the Judicial Conference Committee. Uh, the question, can you monitor a juror's publicly available blog or Facebook page? That's really the same answer as before. As long as you're not alerting the juror to that, you can still monitor them. And the, which raises the question, why would you want to do that? Well, what happens if you find, like, find out they've been online during the trial and they're not supposed to be? Uh, you don't have an obligation to check, but if you find out, you do have an obligation to report it to the tribunal. Uh, so about the only way you're going to be able to do that is if, if you are monitoring, and, and you should be. Uh, but just mindful of that, not alerting them to, to the fact that you're doing that. Judges, uh, may you friend judges, you may, but I wouldn't. And the last judge I talked to about this said, I just took my Facebook page down. There's just too much room for, for problems. Um, and in fact, you know, in Florida, they say you can't do it at all. It gives the appearance of being an actual friend of the lawyers. In North Carolina, there was a case in which the uh, judge and an attorney were actually discussing on Facebook publicly a case in front of them, which was a pretty easy case to, to, to reprimand the judge. Uh, and then there are a number of cases. Generally, they all come down to, uh, I think there are about eight jurisdictions that say you can do it, but you can't publicly discuss cases or anything. You can't be any appearance of impropriety. Uh, finally, please feel free to follow me on social media, but I'll advise you that unlike our friends from Cleveland and from Chicago, I'm from New Orleans, I don't know what baseball is. Uh, <laughs> football starts tonight. Uh, I go back to the days of wearing a bag on my head for the Aints. So there's, and that changed in 2009, 2010. So for Cleveland fans, there's always a possibility. Chicago, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs>